In Gujarat, another victim of violence is laid to rest. This man was killed the night before by a rampaging Hindu mob. The mourners haven't travelled far to pay their last respects, because like many graveyards, this one has also become a refugee camp. Since February, the Muslims of Gujarat have been the target of unprecedented brutality, often at the hands of those who are meant to protect them, the police. Murder, rape, houses torched, people burnt alive. Over 1,000 people have died, and more than 100,000 have become refugees in their own land. It's a violence against the people, against their women and children, displacing them in their tens of thousands. And then it's a violence to ensure that they will never rise again as a people. In Amnabad, the capital of Gujarat, the refugee camps are home to people who used to live just outside the graveyard walls. But repeated attacks have forced them inside. The dead are now sharing their space with the living. The refugees are trying to make life as normal as possible. But there's no escaping the trauma. This little girl thought my silver camera was a gun, and no one could stop her screaming. In one corner of the camp, a widow, Nasim Banu, has been provided with this house for her six children. The local police shot her husband at close range three times as he fled from advancing mobs. One bullet pierced these documents in his breast pocket. The violence which spread all across Gujarat began in late February after this train carrying Hindu pilgrims was attacked by Muslims. One carriage was torched, and 58 people died, mostly women and children. Hindu mobs responded with murder and arson. Four days later, India's then Minister for Home Affairs, L.K. Advani, visited the burnt-out train, and with the state's Chief Minister Narendra Modi, pleaded for calm and security. Not only has the violence to be curbed, but a sense of security has to be communicated to all citizens of Gujarat. This is that our responsibility. His call failed to stem the attacks. <laughs> India is no stranger to violence. For centuries, zealots have killed in the name of religion. But there's something very different about what's been happening in Gujarat. Dr. John Dial, seen here at a rally to end violence in Gujarat, is a human rights activist and president of the All-Catholic Union of India. Since 1968, 
he has studied 200 examples of riots or violence between Hindu and Muslim communities. He says the violence has been perpetrated by Hindus who are backed by the state government. The violence is almost unilateral after the first incident. And secondly, the complicity of the state, the utter and absolute absence of the rule of law. Is, is, marks it out from the rest of them. Modi chaitaini, ye sarkari nahi chaitai. Musliman ke bachcho ke naam ke dushman bane bate. Aapas jao aapas. Khota hi bolte. Talwara leke paai pa leke khade rehte ke maar dalo inko yahi. Koi bhi orat jati hai itta acha chaar kar rahe. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places of worship, mosques and dargahs were destroyed. Some of them were destroyed not by fire but by bulldozer, and a road was built overnight. Could this be done without state enterprise? Dr. Dial's analysis of state complicity in the violence is supported by a raft of recent investigations and fact-finding reports. India's National Human Rights Commission found... There was a comprehensive failure of the state to protect the constitutional rights of the people of Gujarat. Human Rights Watch in this report says... Even as attacks continue, the Gujarat State Administration has been engaged in a massive cover-up of the state's role in the massacres. As people took to the streets to protest at the slaughter in Gujarat, a leaked British Foreign Office report said the violence had all the hallmarks of ethnic cleansing. The Indian government responded coolly. We have already said that we reject interference in our internal affairs by the European Union or any other country through media leaks and slanted comments by unidentified foreign diplomats. As in any vigorous democracy, our institutions and our public opinion are involved in an open and free debate about events in Gujarat and self-corrective democratic processes are at work. But the self-corrective processes didn't seem to be working. As the killings continued, there was uproar in India's capital, Delhi. The government narrowly survived a censure motion. Prime Minister Vajpayee claimed he hadn't realised unrest in Gujarat would turn into a slaughter. The Prime Minister's mea culpa rang hollow for many. Those who've studied the unrest say his own party, the Hindu right-wing BJP, had played a major part in fomenting the violence. They want to prove to the rest of the country that their ideology works. Their ideology which is absolutely fascist, which does, is intolerant, which does not give room or space to any other thinking to any other minority. Father Cedric Prakash is the director of Prashant, a non-government organisation specialising in conflict management. He's received a National Human Rights Award for his work and is well known in Ahmedabad, where he tours volatile areas, intervening when violence begins. Parts of the city have been under curfew day and night. India is usually teeming with people, but here silence reigns. Father Prakash blames the BJP-controlled state government for the violence. They would like to engineer a genocide, or they are engineering a genocide, uh, because they want to ensure that their, bra their brand, uh, their ideology, which is called Hindutva, which means one nation, one race, one culture, one language, one religion, um, is in place here in the state of Gujarat. The charge that the state government has engineered genocide in Gujarat is raised by at least two national non-government organisations in India. The government of India has not yet responded to the genocide allegation. <laughs> the ideology of Hindutva is promoted by key organisations like the Rashtriya Swayam Savak Sangh, or RSS.
The RSS training starts at an early age, in sessions like these, but includes Indians of all ages. It's a massive paramilitary-style organisation that peddles a potent brand of nationalism and has long been a political nursery for the ruling BJP. India's Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister and the current caretaker Chief Minister of Gujarat have all been members of the RSS, along with millions of Indians. We are trying to unite the Hindu society we are trying to give them patriotism, moral values. We are trying to make them culturally strong. So that ultimately this country progresses. Any country can progress only when the people of the country are united. They have the feeling of patriotism in them. So that is the main objective, that is the main activity of the RSS. The RSS was born in almost identical circumstances as the National Socialists of, of Germany, trying, feeding on paranoia, feeding on despair, feeding on joblessness, building up images of a past which may have existed, which may not have existed. The RSS runs schools and provides aid to poverty-stricken communities. But according to Father Prakash, it also has a long history of supporting fascism. Today in the history books of Gujarat, B.F. Hitler has a hero who lent dignity to the German people who gave them a sense of identity. It's a big figment of uh, the uh, imagination of some of the so-called secular intellectuals that RSS uh, supported Hitler or something like that. There's absolutely no truth about it. RSS concept of Hindu nationalism is totally different from uh, Hitler's, uh, Hitler's idea of a fascist nation who done all that. The RSS may deny their affinity for fascism, but their ultra-nationalist fervour has fuelled the violence in Gujarat. And their close ally, the VHP, also known as the World Hindu Organisation, is even more strident. They're another key player in Gujarat. They believe India's politicians favour minorities, and the majority 800 million Hindus are paying the price. Hindus, even though they are in majority, but they are treated as second-rate citizens in the country. And their problems are never, are never attended to by the government and the political parties. So therefore, it, this organization was formed to deal with these problems and to raise these issues and mobilize public opinion. The VHP's ability to mobilise public opinion was tested in the city of Ayodhya in 1992, when a mob of their supporters stormed the Babri Mosque. The aim was to destroy this symbol of Islam. The battle that followed claimed 1,200 lives and sparked a frenzy of violence across India. No, 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 we never incite violence, we never propagate violence. We only say, you must be determined to fight for your rights. But not in a violent way. In a normal democratic way. L.K. Advani, now Deputy Prime Minister of India, shown here near the mosque, was reportedly involved in the attack. He later faced a special court charged with criminal conspiracy, trespass and intimidation of public servants. In May this year, the charges were dropped. He was the same leader who pleaded for peace at the burnt-out train. He and his BJP allies, including the Prime Minister, won power in India in 1999. They now hold 56 positions in the 77-member coalition cabinet. They radicalised the country, they roused hidden passions. The race, you could call it a political army of supernationalist religious people. In 1998, the BJP took power in Gujarat and later installed Narendra Modi, another Hindu nationalist, as chief minister. 
and since then it has literally been no holds barred for them without stops they have just gone full throttle full throttle is first of all they began christian bashing they pulled down churches they burned churches they intimated they harassed the christians then we have had the censors on muslims on christians we have had the communalizing of almost anything and everything there are suspicions that a secret census taken by gujarat police in 1999 provided authorities with detailed information on the muslim community that was later used to plan a comprehensive attack this translation of a police document appears to confirm those fears the document calls for details of muslim organizations and their leaders their names addresses total members telephone numbers a campaign was clearly being orchestrated when the mobs attacked hindu houses were left untouched while muslim houses right next door were destroyed According to Dr John Dial the police tactics included isolating whole communities Sometimes they would impose a curfew in an area which had a muslim majority and not impose it in an area where there was a muslim minority so the mobs went and killed the muslims in the smaller ghettos and the brother muslims could not come even to the rescue because they were locked up in their houses in the curfew Despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary Chief Minister Narendra Modi told the BBC he's happy with the way his police have handled the situation. Not only enough but excellent work they have done. Excellent work. Excellent work they have done within 72 hours. We were able to control such a violence. More than 500 people dead, most of them innocent civilians and you're calling this excellent work? I am I'm, I'm not happy what happened, but what we have done, I'm happy. The chief minister may be happy but the national human rights commission begs to differ its report details how 50 people were burnt to death by a mob despite the police being informed that the victims were in danger representatives of many non-government organizations and some prominent citizens narrated a number of cases where they contacted the police but their pleas evoked no response The commission also heard testimony that state government ministers were present in police control rooms during the riots. According to Human Rights Watch, a key state minister is reported to have taken over a police control room, issuing directions not to rescue Muslims in danger of being killed. In Gujarat now there is ample evidence that ministers took over police control rooms they actually stood by in police control rooms and as the frantic calls for distress sos calls came in their presence ensured that the police would not act despite the evidence of the victims expert observers parliamentary censure and disturbing reports the violence continues if less intense than before The government of India has responded to the National Human Rights Commission saying it's examining how to deal with the numerous cases of murder in Gujarat and that it's fully alive to the issue of police reform. But those who know Gujarat well fear that what's happened here may just be the beginning. If this succeeds here in Gujarat, I am sure this same model will be carried to other parts of india and i'm i'm afraid in many parts of india it will succeed india i think cannot and should not become a rightist a fundamental state because once india turns its back on the parliamentary system of government on democracy i sincerely think that all is lost